Okay, so let's look at the Steel Eye Girder Ultimate Capacity Check Example. 3400 mil wide deck in concrete, and then a steel girder with a uh, with the sizes that are given down here. Here are my material properties, the F prime C for the deck, the F Y for the steel, the structural steel, and then I have the Phi C and the Phi S for the structural steel is 0.9. I also have the uh, Phi R, which is the Phi for the rebar, that's 0 0.90. And the Fy for the rebar is 400 MPAs. I'm looking at a positive uh, section where I have a positive bending moment. So here are my component uh, bending moments. I've got the girder, the deck, the haunch, the barrier, the live load for the truck, including DLA and the live load for the lane. So you can clearly see that the lane governs over the truck over uh, with the DLA. So let's first calculate our factored bending moment and then we will carry on with uh, the check. So in this case, again, the only factory produced component is the girder. So I'm going to have a factor of 1.1 for calculating my ultimate limit state load for uh, the girder. So I have 1.1 times 5605. Then I have 1.2 times the value for the bending moment for the deck and the haunch, which is 404. I have the barrier now, which is going to be cast on site. So that's going to have a factor of 1.2. So then we get 1.2 times 1684. That takes care of all the component loads due to permanent loads. And then I have a 1.7 factor for live load. There's no DLA for the lane loading. Therefore, for the live load, we get 1.7 times 11,554. This gives me a factored bending moment of 42,408 kilonewton meters. So keep that in mind. This is the factored demand. And then we will look at the factored resistance to see if the system is able to take this bending moment or not. Very quickly looking at the ratios, the B over T for the top flange, I get a value of 8.57 and the B over T for the bottom flange, the value is 8.75. And these, both of these satisfy class two, which means I can use a fully plastic section in this case. Also the H over W value for the web. So the height of the web divided by the thickness of the web is 147, which is less than 150. So that means I have a class four web that does not need to be stiffened. It does not require consistent stiffening along its length. Okay, so where we're going to start with this is calculating the total value of the compressive force within the entire deck. We will look at the compression in the concrete in the deck as well as the compression in the rebar. That will give us the total compressive force that the deck can generate. And we're also going to look at the maximum tensile force that the entire steel girder section can generate. And we will look at the balance of the two and try and figure our way out from there. So the CC is really given by alpha 1 phi C F prime C BE times T slab. So BE is the effective width of the slab. And then TS or T slab is right here. Okay, so alpha 1 phi C F prime C is the width of this stress block. Okay, so this is my expression for the CC, which is the compression in the deck. The deck usually has two mats of rebar, two longitudinal mats, and uh, you can calculate the centroid of that whole rebar. And that's been calculated as D primed S or at a location which is given by D primed S from the top. And that D primed S is given by 100 mils. So we know all the values, um, we can calculate the CC and it comes out to be 16,015 kilonewtons. So just uh, make sure that you're dividing this value by 10 to the three to get your kilonewtons. Let's now calculate the CR value, which is the compression force that 
this rebar can generate. So that's just going to be phi r a r f y. And in that case, I get a value of 27.54 kilonewtons. So the entire compression in the deck, which I'm going to denote, and this is the notation from the code, is C1. That's given by CC plus CR. So you can see that if all the compression was coming out of the deck and the, the rebar in it, then my total would be 16,015 plus 2754. And that comes out to be 18,709 kilonewtons. I'm sorry, that turns out to be 18,769 kilonewtons. Let's look at uh, the TS, the entire tension on the steel section. So that is uh, denoted by C2. This is going to be phi S A S F Y. So this is really your phi S uh, F Y. That's the fully plastified stress. We take the entire cross-sectional area uh, which is 102,200 for this girder and we end up with a force value of 33,982 kilonewtons. Again, remember to divide that by 10 to the 3. So let's see now, is C1 greater than C2? If C1 were larger than C2, then that would mean that you could equilibrate the entire steel tension by some portion in the deck. Uh, but that's clearly not the case in this case. Uh, the steel section produces a value which is much larger than the maximum compression that the deck can generate. Okay, so if that's the case, obviously my plastic neutral axis cannot be in the deck. Some portion of the steel girder will have to be in compression because we have to take some of this area away from tension, put it into compression so that the combined compression coming from the concrete in the deck, the rebar, which is under compression, and some portion of the steel in compression will equilibrate the tension force from the remainder of the steel section. So C1 is not larger than C2 in this case, and therefore the plastic neutral axis is going to be somewhere in the girder cross section. Okay, so let's move to this slide and we'll carry on with our calculations. Uh, just as a reminder, we have an A of 225 mils. The CC that we had calculated earlier was 16,015 kilonewtons, and the CR was given by 2754 kilonewtons. That's the value for CR. And when I add the two together, my C1 is 18,769. I'm just writing those down here so we can keep an eye on these. So it's clear that uh, the concrete deck by itself and the rebar, they cannot equilibrate the tension in the girders. So what we have to do is figure out the difference uh, between the two. Uh, the maximum tensile uh, stress or tensile force that the girder can produce and the maximum compression that the deck and the rebar can produce. And we will split the difference between the two. So really what I need to do is come up with this CS value, the compression in the steel, which is given here uh, by this. So if my difference is phi S ASFY, that's the total tensile uh, force that the entire section can generate. I subtract from that the C1. Okay, so that is this 18,679. This is the excess uh, which needs to be equilibrated. That's the imbalance between the two. So if I take half of this force and say that half of this force is going to go to steel and the remainder is going to stay in here, then I can calculate my CS based on this formula. So the CS is now easily calculated. Okay, so we have the C1 and these values, so then I calculate my CS to be 7606 kilonewtons. What this means now is that when I add the CR, the CC, and the CS, the summation will be equal to TS because the equilibrium has to hold. And what we did was we calculated the imbalance that was generated by the maximum values and we split it in two halves. We gave the one half to the 
steel section in compression. Okay, so if I use sigma Fy equal to zero on this cross section, simple statics, I find that my TS now should be equal to CS plus CC plus CR. Okay, so we have calculated the CC and the CR, and now we've gotten hold of the CS. So to equilibrium, uh, in order for equilibrium to hold, the TS is going to be the summation of these three forces that we've calculated. So really, we could add 18,679 to 7606. The answer that I get is 26,375 kilonewtons. So that's the total tensile force that the steel section will generate, and that is going to be split three ways uh, in, on the compression side for equilibrium to hold. The next step now is to figure out if uh, the, the plastic neutral axis is going to be somewhere in the flange, or the top flange, or in the web. Okay, and for this, we have to proceed as follows. We have the value, um, that um, the maximum force that the top flange can generate. So that's going to be given by phi s, area of the top flange, multiplied by Fy. So this is the total force that the top flange can produce. If this value is greater than Cs, which is the compression in the steel, then, then obviously we will see that, uh, or say that the plastic neutral axis is in the top flange. So if the flange capacity is larger than the total force that can be generated, of course the plastic neutral axis will somewhere be in the flange. If not, it will have to drop lower uh, just for equilibrium purposes. Okay, so really what we need to do now is uh, look at how deep the plastic neutral axis is going to be relative to the top of the top flange. Okay, so in this case, what we do is we calculate phi s atf fy, so tf is simply just for the top flange, and what we find is that we can now calculate this by 0.95 times 350, which is the fy, and then atf the flange is 600 by 35, that's the top flange. Again, everything is in kilonewton or newton, so I divided by 10 to the 3 to get 6982 kilonewtons. Uh, now I see that this value is really smaller than the CS value. So that means that my uh, PNA is going to be in the web. Now, if it is in the web, what I have in terms of the area over which the plastic stress uh, occurs is the area of the top flange and plus I have the area of this web that I have to calculate. Okay, so the thickness of the web is TW, and the depth of the web, which is under this compress compressive force, is given by this height. That height is given by uh, YTC, which is uh, something I'm showing here from the top to the assumed plastic neutral axis depth, minus the thickness of the top flange. So really, I'm subtracting this total depth. Um, I'm subtracting the thickness of the top flange from this total depth. That gives me the height of the portion in the web, and I multiply it by the thickness of the web. So this is the total area that is under the equivalent plastic stress. And I multiply it by the factor phi s and the stress Fy, this should equal CS. And when I simplify this, I get a value for YTC, which is this total depth. The expression, you can confirm this, really simple to uh, just isolate this YTC out of this expression. What I get is CS over phi S Fy minus area of the top flange, and add to that the thickness of the top flange. And when I run my numbers, I come up with a value of 134 mils. So you can see that um, the depth to the plastic neutral axis from the top is 134 mils, which is larger than the thickness of the top flange, which is 35. And that means that my plastic neutral axis is going to be in the web.
Now, having done the previous steps, I want to figure out the equivalent location, the centroid of the force, of the force Cs, and its uh, position relative, relative to the top of the top flange, okay? And you'll see why I need to do that. But really, now you are looking at a section which looks like a T-section. And that's uh, all we have to do. We've got to figure out the centroid of this cross section because the force is uh, coming about as a result of uniform stress on this. So really the CS is going to be applied at the centroid of this T section. Now I can calculate that as follows. Um, and this is, I'm taking you way back to maybe first year of engineering, but really this is the width of the top flange, B of the top flange, this is the thickness of the top flange, and this is given as uh, the total depth here is YTC, and this is YTC minus thickness of the top flange. Okay, so if I work from the top fiber here, I have the area of the top flange, which is given by BTF and the thickness of the TF, and multiplied by the half height of this rectangle, so that'll be TTF divided by two. That is the area times the distance from this assumed line about which we are trying to figure out the uh, centroid for this shape. And then I have um, YTC minus TTF. That is the height of the web portion. Multiply that by the thickness of the web. And then the centroid of this rectangle has to be calculated relative to the top fiber. And that's going to be given by YTC minus TTF. You divide that by two because that's supplied here and add to that the thickness of the top flange to get you to the top. Okay, so that's uh, the expression for the area times the Ys. So that's really area times the distance for each one of the shapes and we divided by the total area of the shape. So that's the area of the top flange and the area of the web in compression. Okay, so I can put all the values in here and I come up with a Y prime T value of 23 mils. So that means that this force is really going to be applied at a at a location which is within the flange. That's uh, the uh, the force location. Okay, so I had just shown this as a uh, as a notional uh, at a notional distance, but really this force is uh, only at 23 mils. Okay, so we can now determine the distance YBC, which is the distance of the plastic neutral axis from the bottom of the bottom flange. And YBC, as you can see, is given by H, which is the total height, minus YTC. That's the distance from the top of the top flange to the plastic neutral axis. So this value is given by 2875 minus 134, which is the YTC, the value we had calculated before. The answer we get is 2741 millimeters. In the same vein that we calculated the Y prime T, we also have to calculate the Y prime B, which would be the distance of TS from the bottom of the bottom flange. So in this case, we are dealing with an inverted T. That's the section we are looking at. I'm not going to go through the process, but it's exactly the same procedure as we used up here to calculate the Y prime T value. So when we go through that, the Y prime B value is calculated as 907 millimeters. Okay, so we're in the home stretch for this example. Now it will become more clear as to why we were trying to figure out the exact location of these forces. So we need to know where the TS is applied, where the CS is applied, where the CC is applied, and where is the CR. The CR is obviously happening right where the centroid of the rebar is. So uh, now we need to calculate these distances. ES is really the distance from the TS value to uh, the CC value, or I'm sorry, the CS value. 
Okay, so this is my ES. This is the distance between the tensile force generated by the steel section to the compressive force generated by the steel girder. So that distance is going to be given by H minus Y prime T minus Y prime B. Okay, so that's um, why we had to calculate these values. So you've got the H value here, which is the total. Subtract from that the Y prime B, which is this, and subtract from that the Y prime B, and you're left with this as the distance between these two. When I calculate these values, I end up with a total value of 945 mils. EC is next, which is now going to be the distance from the TS to CC. That's my EC, and this is given by H. Okay, so that's the height here. Uh, plus, I have the thickness of the deck divided by 2. This gets me from the bottom of the girder to the center of the deck because all of the deck is in compression, so CC is applied at the center of the deck. And then I have to take away from this the Y prime bottom to get the distance between the tensile force and the compressive force in the deck. So minus Y prime B is what will give me the E sub C and that I get as 2,081 mils. By the way, I'm going to convert them to meters here. So this is 1.945 meters, and this one is 2.081 meters. Similarly, my ER is going to be given by H plus T deck. That's get me all the way to the top from all the way to the bottom, minus D primed S. So now I'm looking at the distance from this point all the way to this point, but I really have to look at the distance from the TS. So again, I have to subtract the Y prime B from this, and the result for this is 2,093 mils, or 2.093 meters. Okay, so now we can calculate your, our MR, and that we can do in any in many different ways, we can take the bending moment about the plastic neutral axis, about any of the forces. Because we have uh, calculated the distance uh, of each one of the compressive forces about the tensile force, uh, we're going to use those distances. So really, because we're taking the bending moment about this line, TS has no lever arm about that line, and therefore it will drop out. And the expression that we're left with is CSES plus CCEC plus CRER. Those are the three forces that have lever arms about this line, and that will be my total moment of resistance. So now I can calculate this. Uh, my CS was 7606. Multiply that by 1.945, which comes from right here. Then I have. Um, the CC, which is 16,015 times 2.018. And finally, the CR, which is 2754 multiplied by 2.093. So my MR, when I calculate everything out, is 53,885 kilonewton meters. And this, you can see, is larger than the factored bending moment, which we recall was equal to 42. 408 kilonewton meters. So this is okay. The one thing that we still have to check is if there needs to be capacity reduction due to web slenderness. So if a large portion of the web is in compression, if the plastic neutral axis is too deep, the code does not let us use the entire web depth in compression for calculating our capacity. And the idea behind that is that your web can buckle in that scenario. So there is one little check we need to do uh, to satisfy the code completely. So far, we worked with all the basic principles, and it is exactly in line with what the code wants us to do. Uh, so hopefully, the, the thinking is sinking in now that we don't just blindly use the code formulas. We can always go to these basic principles. And you saw in this case, we really worked with some basic principles and distances. Uh, and a stress formulation uh, to come up with our capacity. So let's do the final check. It really asks us to calculate DC, which is the depth of the web in 
compression. So really that's the distance from the top or the bottom of the top flange to the plastic neutral axis. So this will be given by YTC, which is the total depth uh, of the steel section and compression minus the thickness of the top flange. And that comes out to be 99 mils. And what the code says or asks us to check is to make sure that DC is less than or equal to 850 times the thickness of the web divided by square root of Fy. If that's the case, then we don't have to worry about any slenderness issues in the web. The depth of the web in compression is small enough that we can rely on fully plastic distribution through the entire depth uh, that's in compression. So when I look at this, I get 850 times 19 divided by a square root of 350. And that value is given by 863 mils. And you can see that that is much larger than my uh, DC, so we're okay. So that means that we do not need to determine any reduction for our moment of resistance, which is given by 53,885, and that is larger than the factored bending moment. So this composite section satisfies the ultimate limit state check.